Good morning and welcome to the FSB national webinar, Creating a Deeper Connection with Your Audience. I am Sarah King and I am the Development Manager for FSB London and I thank you for joining us all today. Our FSB members who are going to be speaking today are Nigel Davis from PIM Creative and a Amy Burnett from Visible Impact. Nigel will be presenting first, followed by Amy. There will be time for you to ask questions, but please do feel free to use the questions to panellists button to send over your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll endeavour to answer as many questions as we can today. Today's session will be recorded and shortly available on our on-demand pages on the FSB website, so you can tune in again, watch it again, and enjoy the knowledge. If you aren't yet an FSB member, we'd love to have the opportunity to speak to you more. And also you can look at our FSB website under the membership page, that's at www.fsb.org.uk, and we can introduce you to a membership advisor as well. So I'm going to now pass you over to our first guest speaker of today, and that is Nigel Davis of PIN Creative. Thanks, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. It's really lovely to be here. My name is Nigel, as Sarah's just uh, said, and I'm going to be talking about branding. And I'm really passionate about branding, but sometimes I feel that it's a little bit overcomplicated. And so what I try and do is sort of demystify that and make it a lot simpler. So um, I've noticed that through all the kind of work that I've done in branding that actually generally business owners have the answers, and my task is to actually bring that out to them and so hopefully by asking some questions of you today you'll get some actually solutions to some of the issues you might be facing with your brand um, when I um, first started working in branding I was much more corporate I did lots of big kind of projects um, nationally more recently I've been working with things like radio player in the past I did things like Ford Motor Company but at the moment I'm sort of focused on helping small business owners to actually achieve more with their brands. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing to think about is how do you create a brand? And this is just sort of like some of the basics about branding. And really, I think the first thing is to help understand what a brand really is. So we've got lots of products here, different services, newspapers, shoes, coffee, things like that. Now they're all brands and they're all things that you might be aware of, but, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, the, the one thing that I think is really important is creating that emotional connection. Once you've got that emotional connection with a brand and the product and service, you feel good and you feel like you've made the right buying choice. And that's what we're trying to do with all sorts of branding. Now, most of you will have had a business idea, and that's kind of really the starting point for anything, really. And quite often what happens is you take that idea, create a logo and put it onto a website. And that's not really creating a brand. But it's a really important thing to do because you need to actually get your idea out into the marketplace when you start to build a brand there's quite a lot more to consider so this is like a jigsaw puzzle that you know it's almost like a very complicated thing again where we've got to think about lots of different things at the same time but i try and break these activities into three key things thinking about the insight thinking about the story and thinking about the engagement and then with engagement there's different sorts of engagement there's verbal engagement names messaging all that sort of stuff and then visual engagement which is all about the logos and today i'm going to sort of focus around insight and story and then show you how by creating some relevant insights and some memorable uh, unique stories you can actually create more memorable engagement one of the key things to the way that i do this is by having a framework it's a business model that actually helps people orientate their brand i call it a brand donut and it addresses these key things about your vision, your position, your offer, values and mission. These are all things that you really need to do at the start of developing a brand and get this nice jam core center, this sort of gluey, sticky jam that kind of glues everything together because that really, really helps kind of people remember who you are. So these are the six questions. Why does it matter? Why, who do you admire? What's most important? What are you proud of? What makes you different? and why does it matter again now all of these map to those different areas in the donut the vision the position the offer the values the mission and the core and what i tend to find with business owners if they are struggling to kind of answer some of these questions really really focus on that i mean some of them you're going to find easy you might be really clear on what your offer is but you might find it harder to actually think about the mission and that's where 
you need to start focus. But this presentation will give you a little bit of direction for each one. I'm going to start with the insight bits. You know, how do we make it relevant? The first thing is that you do need a clear vision. It's really important that as a business owner, you understand what the vision is. And it might all very well say, where are you going to be in five years time? You're going to make some money. You're going to have a massive office. You're going to have success. You're going to win awards. But you sort of need to go deeper than that in terms of what your vision is. You know, why does that really, really matter? Keep asking yourself this question. Keep asking yourself why you've said what you've said. So you get a much deeper reason, a much bigger reason for why you've set up this business in the first place. And once you've got a clear vision in place, place you can then start building a brand to move towards that and it's absolutely fine if your vision changes but at least you've got a sense of direction so that's question one why does it matter the next thing is to start thinking about competition and it's really important to look at competition don't be afraid of them everyone has got um, competition and what i would suggest is that yes look at direct competitors you know it's, very, it's the obvious place to start you know what are they better at what are they not as good what's unique about them all those sort of things that you can see quite clearly but also bear in mind other things that are out there. So really big famous businesses, things that you would like to be as good at one day. They might be like, you know, they might be a billion dollar business today, but you can learn from them. You know, what are the things that you'll do when you're famous? And then finally, I would always encourage people to the brands that you love. Anything that you love that you will buy, like I buy Adidas all the time, there's something about those that you can bring into your brand that would also attract people of like mind. Um, Having done a bit on the insight, we then start to move on to the story. And again, we're just sort of building this and giving you some sort of inspiration for direction, really. So we're going to think about the offer, values, mission and core, the what, what, how and why. The first thing about your offer, you really got to make the best thing visible. Think of it like a shopping basket. You want the nice, freshest, juiciest things at the top that people can see. I would even say only have one thing in your basket if you can. Because the less choice that you give people, the easier it is they're going to um, um, in terms of actually making the right buying decision. And, you know, if you've got other offers, make those less visible. Don't worry about that. Make your best thing the most visible. Again, think of it like a, a department store. You would put the best things in the window and there might be something at the back of the store that people would find eventually. But you really want to attract things to the things that you do that are the best. So that's thinking about the offer. We then keep moving around the donut thinking about your values. Now, some people really have values hot wired into themselves. So, you know, you know, it could be something that you've always thought about. But if you haven't, think about these as triggers for defining your values. Think about when you were most proud, happiest or satisfied. And these will kind of help you determine a set of values that can actually ring true for yourself. But the important thing about values, whilst they're true to yourself, they need to be relevant to your audience. You need to make them connect with the audience that you're trying to attract. So my values, my business name is Pin Creative, about pragmatic, inspiring and nurture. I think it's very important that you keep things simple, but at the same time, creative, inspiring. If people work with me, I want to learn from them as much as they want to learn from me. So your values have to have a meaning. So once you've defined your values, try and think about what they mean for your audience as well. The final bit on the outside of the donut is all about the the mission and the mission is really the skills that you bring that help kind of achieve that vision, that big vision that you've already sort of decided on. And those skills are really important. And there's going to be lots of practical skills that you bring. So Superman, yeah, he had sort of eyes of, of lasers and things like that. And he was really strong, but you will have a single superpower at the center of that, that will really help you actually be even better than the competition and focusing on your superpower is really important. At the same time, be aware of your kryptonite, be aware of the things that you're not so good at, because you can also learn from those as well. And so I think it's really important that you take those things on board. So we've got all the way around the donut now. And what I always do is I get a single sheet of paper out and I just scribble all this down. I actually write it in these sort of little quadrants, these little sections of the donut. And then I start thinking about what the core, what is the thing that's gluing all those things? What's connecting my vision to my values, my mission, my offer, etc. And I actually just start to, to scribble them around. But then what I try to do is bring that all into a more coherent story. Summarize that in, you know, you've probably got like, you know, 50, 80 words of kind of different themes and ideas by now. And try and create a single story in about, let's say, 40, 50 words, and then reduce that down to about 20 words. And then finally, just try and write it in a few words, you know, four words if you can, 
to really get that core. And once you've got that core idea, it's really then easy to actually create all the messaging and all the visual identity work that you want to do. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of how you engage and make things more memorable with a strong brand core. And these are just examples from things that I've done in the past. So I worked with an organization called iCar and they just wanted to sell the change the perception of cars and how they were sold by not having kind of these sort of seedy kind of sales people on forecourts. So they just wanted to do it online, wouldn't even need to make a meter salesperson. So I worked with them on their, their story, went through all that donor and actually kind of got to this notion that their brand core was all about the pure joy of driving. That was the most important thing. And if anything, the thing I was focusing a lot on was the mission and how they're going to deliver their vision for this business. So once we had the pure joy of driving, it was then much easier to create a name. I kind of came up with this visual of a really happy dog and actually then came up with this name Rocker. So it got the kind of word car locked in there, but it was the name of a dog and it was just a much more engaging way. They sold this platform and now in partnership with Jaguar. So that was very successful, but it was about thinking about the mission and the core idea, pure joy of driving. So CADA, Coordinated Action Against Domestic Abuse, uh, a second tier charity, but doing very important work, but they were just unknown. They had a name that was hard to say, hard to spell, hard to remember. And they realized that the work they were doing was really important. So I worked with them and actually a lot of time on this was spent around their vision, thinking about actually it was a vision and a position. So the vision really where they wanted to be in the future, but also how they wanted to differentiate themselves from different charities out there that were actually supporting abuse. So we came up with this position around safety for all the family, and that became the sort of strong core. Again, once we had the, the notion of safety for all the family, we rebranded them, gave them a new name, Safe Lives. And so now they're kind of Duchess of Cornwall, seem to be the queen, is the, is the patron of the charity. So they have a lot more cut through now. They have a lot more kind of uh, fame, if you like, for the great work that they're doing, because they actually focus on their vision and their position. And then the final example I want to share with you is a firm called DAPW, Duvet and Pillow Warehouse. And they were lost in a crowded marketplace selling kind of duvets and pillows out of brown boxes, you know, just like you might get from Amazon or anywhere. And they were really sort of struggling to cut through. So I worked with them and a lot of this was focusing on their offer, thinking about the things that they sell. So at one point they could have sold anything to anyone almost as long as it was in a house. We said, no, let's just focus on the bed and bath market. It's big enough and thought about what actually connects the bed and bath market. And it's all about enhancing relaxation time. And once we've got that notion of enhancing relaxation time to start of the day, end of the day, whether it's having a shower or having a bath or going to, going to sleep and waking up fresh, all those things, we were then able to think of a, a name that was more compelling for them, so can sleep. And within a year, they actually got better to recall for their brand than Ikea and John Lewis that had been doing this sort of stuff for years. So they're just a few things that I wanted to kind of express. So once you think about the donut and those six questions, find where to focus and then actually kind of deliver on that through the engagement. So a couple of takeaways really is that from the insight, really look at competitors and admire brands. You can learn a lot from them. It's not copying, it's learning. In the story about making it unique, limit your offer, streamline that journey, make it really simple for people to find the things that they want. And then finally, when you're making it memorable, just simplify all the elements, keep them as simple as possible so your message is clear. Some people kind of create these brands that get really, really complicated and no one knows where to look. So hopefully you found that interesting. I'm going to answer questions at the end or I'll look into the chat. Um, if you want to learn more, you can do a quick brand check. So we'll put these links in later, but you know, two minutes to find out where you need to focus on your brand. Uh, just answer some questions. It's very, very quick and it'll give you some results. Or you can also download the guide. So everything I've gone through, the six questions in detail, asks you those questions and shows you how to fill in your brand donut and actually then help you move forward with your brand. So hopefully that's helped you with entangling your brand. And next I'm going to pass over to Amy that's going to talk about video. Thank you. Hello, um, thank you very much, Nigel. So I am Amy Burnett and I am the founder of Visible Impact, which is a 
video production company based in the South, and we work with SMEs to create video content to help them connect with their audience. And I'm very passionate about using video for human connection in particular. And I'm going to start today, well, I, I'm here really to help you understand why you should be using video to connect with your audience and a bit about how you can do this. So going to start by looking at some numbers. Uh, so we're going to start with the top two numbers, 82%. So 82% of all online traffic, everything that's being uploaded or downloaded on the internet is video content. And the huge number underneath that, one and a half billion, is the number of hours of YouTube videos that are watched every single day. So huge number. Now, I know that the majority of that video content that I've just mentioned isn't going to be business video content. We all know that YouTube has an array of video content on there, um, as, does, as do all the other platforms. But what these numbers show is how video has become such an, in, such an important part of our everyday lives. And these video, the, these numbers, sorry, are an indicator of how our audience use video every single day and how they're coming to expect to see video uh, on a screen when they are looking at the screen. The numbers below are very much more focused with um, on to, to business video. So I think it was Wise Al did a survey uh, with marketeers and 86% of the marketers they interviewed said that they had used video in their marketing strategy over the previous 12 months. Out of those 86%, 78% said that they had seen a direct impact, positive impact on their sales as a result of using the video and they're going to be using video in the coming 12 months again. So that really shows you how how much of an effect it can have and how it really can work for business. But so we're told that we should be using video all the time. It's something that many of us mean to do. A lot of us never quite get round to doing it. It can often slip down that to-do list. Um, but what is it about video that works? Why those marketeers, why are 78% of those marketeers planning on using it? Well, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, it captures attention. It's a moving image. So it is perfect for social media. You know, it's attention grabbing. It's somebody, somebody's eye will be drawn to that rather than a static image or static text. So it's great for social media. It can be really easy for the viewer to consume your content. You know, video is easy. It can it can convey messages in a very short period of time and we're all time short. Our attention spans are decreasing and decreasing all the time. And so that's what makes it really good for the viewer. And also it can be entertaining. Your audience, you know, we're, we're, every time we're looking at a screen these days, we're, we're being entertained in some form, of, in some form or another. And that's what our audience are expecting. And then with regards to your branding, video is a great opportunity. There's so many layers within a video that can help you connect your brand with your audience. So you've got an opportunity to use music, you can have text, you can use animation, you can use a voiceover, you can be filming something live. There's so many layers there that you can build to really create a brand overload. And when you've got all those layers together and you're connecting with your audience visually as well as through audio, the science behind it means that those connections are being embedded deeper into their brain, the, the brain of your viewer. 
it's creating much, much deeper connections, which is really what we're after, because it's those really deep connections that build the coveted know, like, and trust um, that we're all after as business owners. And it's a fast track, really, to that no like, and trust. The deeper your connection, the faster that no like, and trust is going to happen. And then human connection is so important. We all know people buy from people. And that's because we are hardwired to look for faces. When we're born as, as babies, within days, we're scanning a room or scanning the world, looking for faces to connect to. And that never leaves us. And that is why they say people buy from people. And there's been research done, you know, there's little cells in our brain that light up when we see faces that we recognize, whether that's on a screen or whether that's in real life. And as a side note, they're called Aniston cells because the researchers used Jennifer Aniston's face during, uh, during the experiment. So there you go. So if, one, if you want your audience's Aniston cells to light up, then you need to get seen, get your team, get yourself seen on that screen and build that human connection. And so where should we be using video content? Well, the answer to that is whatever channel you are using. Your client base want to be entertained wherever they can be. They're expecting you to use a mix of media when you reach out to them, wherever they are. And with all the communication and social platforms giving you the opportunity to use video now, there's really no excuse. Um, and there is one very latecomer to the video party, which was linked in Facebook and Instagram, obviously were very early adopters. But you have got access to all your audience with regards to video now, because LinkedIn have absolutely embraced video content and they offer a huge selection of ways to use video on their platform. I think there's, there's seven ways, maybe, maybe there's more now, who knows? But my absolute favorite is the direct message. And I think it is one of the most underused video tools within LinkedIn. Um, but it's just a fantastic way to keep in touch with people. It's, a, it's just in the app. I don't think you can use it via the website. It's just in the app, in the direct message options. You can record a really super quick 10 second, 20 second video and stay visible get your face visible to the people that you don't see that much in real life or you don't see that much using video calls. It is just such a fantastic tool. But if you're a, a user on LinkedIn, which most B2B users I'm sure will be, then there's really no excuse for you not to be using video on the platform. And so what kind of videos should you be making? Okay, so you should be using it everywhere. But what kind of videos should you be making? Well, personally, I am all about live video. Now, live video means video that you have filmed or somebody else has filmed. Um, so anything that you film. And again, going back to the human piece, for me, it's all about getting faces in front of the camera. So... There's lots of opportunity for you to do this, whether you're on your own or whether you have a team, you know, get your people seen. Um, and your people include your clients, you know, your clients can tell your stories um, via video. And one thing that I will say at this point, I know speaking on camera can be a very daunting thought and lots of people don't like the idea of it. But I want you to remember that you don't have to speak directly to the camera. Most of my filming is actually done interview style, and that can really help make it a lot easier <laughs> and help people to agree to go on camera in the first place. So get your people seen. Events as well, fantastic uh, opportunity to get filming 
and show your audience what you're doing with your business. There's the education piece, which YouTube is fantastic for, all those how-tos, tutorials, as well as using little snippets of them on social media, updating your uh, audience with the news, what's happening in your business. You know, this is no different to the content that you might be writing about or using still images with. There's not really any difference with what you can create with video content. And don't forget to have fun with it, which many people don't think of fun when they're getting in front of a camera, but it really can be. And there's some great fun tools you can use as well. You've got time lapse, you've got stop motion, really fun little videos that you can create to mix it up and keep your audience engaged. And as well as live filming, there are obviously other options with video as well. There's animation available and for all budgets these days as well. I mean, you can create a little animated video on Canva. Uh, you can pay someone to do it on Fiverr really cheaply. Or you can learn to create things on, uh, on platforms like Powtoon and Biteable, which are, uh, uh, do cost money, but they're still pretty affordable and you can get really creative with them. So there's something for everyone. And then my least favorite is stock video. It's, but it is a really quick and easy way if you haven't got um, time to film, if you can't afford animation, stock video, you can just put together really quickly, really easily, but it will be the, the least way of get the, the least, that didn't make sense, but it will be uh, not have as much a connection with you, a brand's connection with your audience. Uh, because it's it's footage that somebody else has filmed. So that's the kind of content that you can easily create. Before you create your content, what you should be thinking about initially is what platform does this go on? Am I creating this for YouTube? Am I creating it for Facebook, for LinkedIn? Because that will dictate some other um things which are very important when it comes to optimizing your video and making the most of it. So your format, so is it going to be animation or is it going to be live filming? What's the content? What, what am I doing here? What am I out to achieve with my audience? You know, if you're on YouTube, the tutorials are great. If you're on um, Instagram or on TikTok, then it's gotta be short and entertaining. And so, of course, duration is very important once you know what platform your video is for. Is it 15 seconds on TikTok or is it 20 minutes on YouTube or is it 60 seconds on LinkedIn? And your orientation as well. Are you filming this portrait? Are you filming landscape? And square is great for social media these days as well. That can be quite impactful. So think of your platform and then think of all the other things to make sure you're getting the most out of your content. And then coming close to wrapping up here, um, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, he, that, that is not a picture of Gary V, by the way. That is a stock photo of a man who has just heard this amazing um, quote from Gary V. If you're not making some kind of video content right now, you're losing, period. He said this in 2014, and would you believe that he started his first blog in 2006, which I find very scary because uh, that's older than my eldest daughter. Um, but yeah, so it just shows you how long video has been around. It was so successful for Gary Vee and not just him, um, but people like Jean Leger from ex CEO from T Mobile, he saved T Mobile by using video and building up his personal brand to help them build the business brand. Um, current day, Stephen Bartlett loves doing his video podcasts. Again, really building his personal brand so that people know who he is. So it does work. There's some great examples out there that video is so powerful with that connection. And so these people have done it. How do you start? Well, you just press record. It's great to pay someone to come in and create professional video for your website. But on social media, there is no excuse. You've got the most powerful tool in your pocket. 
And all you need to do is to press record with the camera facing you or somebody else or something else and just get into the habit of doing that. It's super quick and easy. And don't forget that when you see these polished videos that people are posting on social media, they didn't start like that. If you go onto somebody's YouTube account and you watch their latest videos, they look lovely, shiny, polished. But if you go back to their early videos, they started somewhere in a very, very different place. So just press record and rinse and repeat. And if you need help, call in the professionals. So that's me. I have been Amy Burnett from Visible Impact. And um, yeah, the key takeaway that I would like you to have is that it's human connection can really fast track that know, like, and trust that you need as a business owner. Gosh, thank you very much indeed to both of our guest speakers today, to Nigel Davis and Amy Burnett. Incredibly inspiring. And I know I've sat here learning a huge amount and um, I hope that you have too. And obviously they both have provided some key takeaways for you. So we have some time for questions. Now we've been keeping an eye on the Q&A and we've answered one so far, but this is a time where you as the audience can put your questions into that Q&A chat. Alternatively, um, if you want to raise your electronic hand, we can introduce you and you can ask your question live to either Nigel or Amy. I do have some questions here that have been sent in advance, but I'm just going to go to the floor first in case there's anybody who would like to ask a question. So while we're just waiting to see who might raise their hand, um, we've got a question in the Q&A from Dermot, and it says, what's the largest growing platform for video content? So that's one for you, Amy. The largest growing platform for video content. Wow. Well, I think um, the largest growing is probably, well, it definitely is TikTok, I would say. Um, it's, not, it, it's not a platform that I know a huge amount about, but I know that it is growing on a huge, huge scale. And people think, I, I, I was reading a little bit about TikTok um, a few weeks back, and I know that initially, and still the majority of the audience on TikTok, or the users, I should say, on TikTok, are fairly young. It's that younger sort of demographic. Um, but that is actually changing, and there are more and more, and I, I can't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but I was really shocked at the amount of, people closer to my age <laughs> that, were, that were using TikTok. Um, it really made me stop and think, actually. So it's uh, I'd say it's certainly grown hugely with older audiences as well as the younger ones. So um, growth-wise, definitely. Although a big shout out to LinkedIn again, because I love the way that they've really embraced it recently. Oh, thank you very much for that answer, Amy. And um, just a, a reminder, actually, to all of our delegates today, please just use a Q&A chat uh, box here for asking questions. And I can see some more that have come in while um, you've been providing the answer, Amy. So we've got a question here from Isabella. It's, can you both give us ideas of packages and prices you offer? So shall I go to Nigel first on this one? Um, yeah, thanks, Isabella. Um, a good, good question. Um, and yeah, putting putting me on the spot in terms of what I can offer is that I do have a number of different ways that people work with. One is a a one to one course over so six hours. I help people go through all those things that um, I've just gone through, and that's about seven hundred and fifty pounds at the moment. I also work directly with brands and help them, but that can start from anything for two to ten to twenty thousand pounds. It really depends how how much work is involved but there's lots of ways of working with me that are at the low end um so i would say get in touch thank you very much nigel and amy would you like to add to that yeah so um really un unlike nigel who's got lots of different ways of working with him really i i i'm just about live video production um 
I don't have set packages because when it comes to video, there's so many, but well, anything creative as Nigel will know, there's so many variables, you know, when certainly when it comes to video. And so I don't have set packages, but generally working with visible impact that would say a starting from point of about one and a half to 2000. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much to both of you. So I've got another question here from Ellie. It says, hi, thanks so much both for your presentations. What is the value of live videos as compared to reels for sales and for follower growth? So that's video related. Amy, over to you, please. Live videos over reels. So reels is Instagram. Again, I'm not a huge Instagram expert. However, um, live videos are very well number one I guess you need you need your audience to be to be there um, at, at the time when they're going out um, but I think that with the live videos generally and this would apply I suppose to Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn is that with a live video um, people do feel more connected to you because they are well, they are with you live it does what it says on the tin um, and so I think there is an even deeper sense of connection than pre-recorded video uh, across the board on, on it. It's, I guess it's like attending something like this, you know, it's in real time. And so it does have a slightly different impact. And obviously what you're doing is giving your audience the opportunity to interact with you during that time as well. So in, in real time. So I would say um, that it, it, it almost does a, a bit of a different job really, but but really a, a deeper connection. I, I would actually say that it, it's it's possibly more impactful in reeling your, your audience in, yeah. Yeah, interesting answer, Amy. And I know from my own experience, I have recently been practicing using reels on Facebook to get used to it. And each reel I've created has just got a little bit better, little new aspects used. So I was going to just actually ask Nigel about it too, because I know Nigel, your business uses Facebook. Have you experienced or used um, reels or live videos on that platform? And how have you found that to help your sales or follower growth? Yeah, so I, all I do know is that, you know, as Amy's sort of very well put, is using video makes, um, makes a big difference. I think I've done a few live streams from Zoom into Facebook groups and Facebook publicly and it's amazing who's watching because when uh, you know, I, I assume that even on Facebook when I don't do it to my group and I do it to my page that no one's interested and then you sort of get on the pub and says oh I saw you talking about this nonsense about branding the other day what's all that to do with donuts it was quite interesting so I think people will kind of look at it and I think you know for me I probably don't do it enough I'm guilty of not doing it enough that's that's 100 percent so that's where we talked with Amy. Amy says, just, just press record. Just press record. record. Yes. So we've got another question here, actually, uh, from Sharon. Can you recommend a good place to uh, lend Premiere Pro or other creation platform? No, I'm... Uh, oh. Yes, for video, video editing, pre Premiere Pro is a video editing software, yeah. Um, and it's probably the most widely used video editing software, to be honest, within the kind of corporate video world. Um, it, it does require, Premiere Pro requires a certain level of skill um, with regards to something that's a bit more of X kind of entry level. There is something and the name has completely slipped out of my mind. It's fantastic. And I always recommend it. <laughs> Don't worry, Amy. If you remember it before the end of this webinar, please mention it. <laughs> absolutely will. I absolutely will. But there are there are lots and lots of um, kind of entry level edit uh, video editing and also video creation. Um, like Biteable is video creation, um, where it's got lots of animation and stock video and things you can bring into your own videos. There's there's lo lots and lots. But um, I'm actually going to look up that other name and I'll come back to you. Oh, thank you very much. So what I might do is I might just ask a question for Nigel next while you're looking that up. So I know one of the other questions we've got is video related. So one for Nigel, this is one that's been sent in earlier, actually. Which is a better brand name for my business? 
a personal name or a corporate name? What do you say, Nigel? Um, yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think I've had a changing position on this. It's interesting that Amy mentioned, I can't remember the name of the brand, but the the talk, um, t I mean, talk talk or something that where they'd started using video to kind of raise, elevate the brand, but it was the MD or the owner who's actually the visible part of it. And it reminded me of the sort of 70s Razor ad, you know, Victor Kayam and uh, Remington. And I think the answer to that really is that you probably need both. So if you're, um, if you, if you're just a coach, an independent person, obviously your, your personal name and your personal brand is really, really important. But I would consider having a corporate brand name, even if it's just something that sits underneath you because it's actually very useful for even practical things like business, invoicing, setting up bank accounts, and actually distancing you as a personal person away from some of the admin. It also enables you to kind of build other products and services. But if you're a corporate person, so I've got a name Pin Creative, which is my corporate brand name, it's really important that you become well known yourself as an independent, as an individual, in, as a person. So you've got to get out there as the person, as Nigel Davies, as much as uh, promoting Pin Creative. Otherwise, the business won't be able to move forward. So there you go. On, on, the, on the fence answer, a bit of both, really. No, it's yeah. very good. And when you make reference to your company name, I liked the way that you connected your values with your company name. But you said P was, I think it was pragmatic, I was inspiring, and N was nurture. That was a really nice approach, a nice angle, actually. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good, good thing because people don't normally ask but when, with any naming the, the secret is is that it shouldn't be that obvious what what the name is but when people ask you want to have a good story behind the name and the pin yeah you know, that's the story behind it it's my values so I, so I can remember them that hardwired into my name thank you oh thank you Nigel now before we go on to the next question that we have so Amy did you remember I've got well I googled it okay. <laughs> it's called Filmora Wondershare and that is a really cracking piece of kind of more entry level software that has the it's got, you know, you've got potential to actually get deeper and deeper into it. But it's good. It's good for beginners as well. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and just on Nigel's point there, it was um, EE, e., Jean Leger EE, e., that was uh, built his personal brand and pretty much saved EE e. from dying a, a, a bit of a death, to be honest. They were in a really bad way until he came along and... Um, Built up his personal brand and saved the business brand. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So, thank to Sharon. Um, we've answered your question there and thank you for looking that up, Amy. So, I, I know I can see a question here from Shanae, but it just says, Hi, Nigel. So, Shanae, if you're on the call still, please could you just re enter your question? We'll come back to you shortly. I've got a question here from Deepak. How do you map the spend on this video marketing to real business? So shall I, well, both, that's to both of you actually. So how do you map the spend on video to real business? And then a question, how do you map the spend on marketing for Nigel to real business? So should we go to you first, Amy? Sorry, how do you map the spend? Yeah, that's the question that Deepak's asked. How do you map the spend on video to real business? On video to real business? Yeah. I, I, I think maybe I would I'd need a bit more information okay. about what, what he's actually after. Okay, Deepak. Yeah, I think what I would probably add, add to that is that you you can't just sort of say, oh, I've spent £100 on a video, or £1,000 on a video, or £10,000 on a video. All these things have got to be done over time, and then you'll see the longer-term impact of activities rather than saying, right, if I invest £10,000 in video today, Will that generate me £100,000? It's almost impossible to say. You've got to do these things cost consistently, uh, whether it's a marketing activity like building a brand, and it will take time. So that it's, it's, and there's another question coming up that's quite similar to that, which I'll talk about as well. Okay, so I know Deepak has followed it up actually, saying both personal and business should be different, so you can sell your business in future and still carry out your personal work. That's a, okay. um, that's Thank just a you. response to that previous comment and I'll just pick up on that and I think um so Deepak's comment there about the um the naming I think it's I think it, that is right that you you want but not everyone wants to have a business that is to be sold they want the fame for themselves so it's going to come down to personal choices 
Um, I'm going to put a link into something, which is a quick quiz that helps you make a decision about corporate versus personal branding. But you really just kind of need to do what's right for your audience. It's kind of, this sounds like the obvious thing. You don't need to, um, I, I think in terms of getting value from selling, you can have a named brand in the, and my, the example, my go-to example for this and where it goes both right and wrong is Jamie Oliver. So it went really, really right for him for quite a long time and then it went wrong. And so then he tarnished his own name and almost had to start from scratch again, but using his own name. And that's because he, he actually went in back to what I was saying about the offer. He started doing too many things to too many different people. And as soon as Jamie got back to this core thing about helping people kind of cook in a simple way, it was a much stronger brand again. So you, you can do both. That's really interesting. Thank you. And Amy, did you want to add anything at that point? No. I, I think Nigel's covered it pretty well. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have a question here from Stephen. Now, I know we're not a social media specific webinar today, but I know you both use social media. So maybe just from your own experiences. So regarding social media, um, we've talked a bit about Facebook and Instagram, but posting algorithms, is there a minimum number of posts a week and time of day when a post is really important? So from your own experience, what do you think has worked for you, Amy? <laughs> I, I think it's just all about understanding your audience. It's where, where you know, where, where is your audience and when are they on it? Everyone's audience is different. Um, I mean, B to B, there is a thing with, with, I mean, LinkedIn is the platform that I use most. Um, and there is this kind of theory that, you know, you need to get on there at eight o'clock in the morning. Your post's got to be kind of either around eight o'clock or around lunchtime, because that's when people who are working generally are on LinkedIn. Um, it seems to work that the sort of eight o'clock in the morning seems to work better for me. Having said that, if you're, you know, if you're on Facebook and you're targeting, you know, you may be more B2C and you're targeting, uh, I don't know, sort of mums who are age 35 to 45, maybe a Friday evening is going to be your, your best time because they might be sat there with their, God, well, I know I am sat there with my glass of wine. You know, if, if I'm your audience, that's the time for, to get me on Facebook. So, it's um you, you've really got to think about who you're targeting when you make decisions like that yeah. some good advice there and Nigel did you have anything else to add to that yeah I think all I would add and um is that you've got to be doing it quite regularly that that is the key key thing because I, I wouldn't worry too about the algorithm four times a day or however many times a day but do it regularly and just remember that you know classic advertising you see the same advert if not for months, for years, don't worry about people seeing it again and having to do new content every single time you post something because some people won't have seen it, some people have forgotten about it. And so keep repeating things and doing it regularly, is my advice, like everyone else is doing in the advertising world. That's brilliant. And um, thank you very much, Nigel. And just Amy, I've got just a quick ask. Uh, Francine has asked, can you please type the name of the guy of EE? -E? So if you wouldn't mind just typing the answer in that one, that would be really helpful, thank you. And we've got a question here from David Allen Sudworth, a similar one, similar to one that's been asked previously, but just in case you've got anything else to add, please. Hi, how do you measure success free brand awareness as opposed to quid pro quo advertising? Yeah, it, it is similar. And I think the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, people talk about return on investment. So you can only measure success of activities if you set up um, some parameters today to measure what it is that you're doing and then the measure of the impact and set some goals. Um, that, that's the only way you do it. And there'll be lots of different ways. I'm not a pricing or expert in any of that whatsoever. All I would say is just think about that advertising is just a marketing, um, you know, it's a selling kind of activity. It's that sort of trying to persuade people to do the sale. I think there's lots of marketing activities that are actually more just about getting that awareness and they're really important. So, you know, marketing and selling is really important. But the third bit, which is branding, which gives people that kind of compelling reason to buy back to this sort of why, why, why. That's why they all kind of three exist in a similar sort of world. So you don't do one or the other. They're all slightly different. They all help and support each other. So you've got to be constantly getting your message out there. You've got to be constantly selling stuff, 
but you've got to be constantly giving people that reason that your brand is more important than anyone else's. Yeah, thank you. thank you very much, Nigel, and I hope that's helped yeah. there with answering that question. I'm going to move down to, uh, because I know the two people here have asked previously, I'll come back to those if we have time, um, but I'm just going to move to the next one, this an anonymous um, attendee, and the question is, how do you deal with the fear of selling yourself when you're starting and growing your business? So go to Amy. Sorry, how do you deal with the how, fear of selling yourself? Yeah, how do you deal with the fear of selling yourself when you are starting and growing your business? Can you remember how you maybe felt at that stage when you were starting out? Starting out and putting myself out there and, and going on camera. And yeah, it's, it's, it's very scary. And I think the thing really is you've just got to remember to be yourself and... Um, just yeah just be just be genuine and just remember that at the end of the day everybody else is is in the same boat <laughs> really and it's it's just a case of um yeah being being authentic so i know that's a word that's used that's used loads and loads but just be authentic and know that uh, it's remembering like uh, i mentioned like gary v uh, and jean Leger and Stephen Bart, you know they know they're not going to be everybody's cup of tea especially Gary V. He's Marmite. You love him or you hate him. Um, and he knew that and he just embraced it. And he was ready to kind of know that actually 50% of people are probably just going to switch off as soon as they see him. But he knew that he was really going to connect with the, the, the people that, the, you know, his audience that he wants to speak to. And so it's just that. It, it's just remembering, yeah, just remembering you're the expert in what you do nobody else is you and just go for it and just know already that yes some people might not warm to you some people might not feel that connection but you will have your tri tribe another word i hate but you will have your people that do thank you very much amy and nigel do you want to add anything there can you remember how you felt when you were sort of starting out in your business and growing your business how did you do with I think, the yeah, I think what I would add is that, you know, the, the first the first thing, you know, back to what I was saying is that, you know, having your idea and bring it to market is a massive step. So you should have confidence in the fact that you've actually even done that. Most people don't get that far. So you should have the self-belief, which is easier said than done, to actually then start talking about it because you are in a position that few people even get to. It's like, I remember when I set my first business, it is like standing at the edge of a cliff wondering whether you should jump and what will happen when you land and no one knows and so congratulations for taking that first little leap and if you don't tell everyone about it then you won't get much further and that's the, that's the, the paradox really so just shout about it and people will love it I guarantee it thank you very much to you both so i've got a question here from zoltan can you say a little more about how to define your most important service and the level of category for this when I look at this, everything I do falls under one category. So Zoltan um, has highlighted manual therapy, but within that, there are lots of options. So for example, structural body work for musicians, so hard to know which level to go for. Does anyone have a go at answering that one? I, I guess that's more of a, a brand question if you want me to have a go at that, Amy. Thanks, what, what I would say in terms of so organizing products and services, you will have a core service or business descriptor of what you do. I think you said that it's um, manual therapy. So manual therapy is the main offer. And within that, there'll be different tiers. You need to create different tiers of either a starting point, so a low price or a high price thing. You know, the, the classic thing, you know, medium, high um, entry and stuff. But they should all have some sort of connection, some natural progression through them. If you start to create things that are so vastly different, that's when people keep um, getting confused. So they should be called things that are quite related to each other. What becomes hard is when you have multiple products at very similar price points that people can't see the difference from. So just to get the clarity in what you call them and the difference in the prices themselves, then you'll kind of help people through their journey of working with you. But the main focus should be understanding what manual therapy is and how it will benefit people and then people will find something that suits them hope that helps that's a great answer thank you nigel so i've got a question here from stephen 
How do you get more people to engage with your videos when your business model is around credit management and chasing debt? Any ideas? And that's to both of you, really. So, Amy, any sort of initial thoughts on that one? Well, you know what? You've it's it's about it's about standing out and doing something different, you know. And I, I always say just to if you're in a business which or an industry which is I always say about like account, accountants apologies to any accountants that are, that are here but you know it, it's bring something else to it do what your audience maybe isn't expecting be the be the funny accountant be the funny solicitor um obviously you know do something that that comes naturally to you but you've got to you've got to make yourself sort of stand out somehow get known get known for doing a certain type of video um you, you know do it on a regular basis i mean you know do it a sort of fr a, a friday funny every friday morning or something it's you know it's about so what was that it was how to how to get more engagement yes yeah so and and don't forget don't forget to think you know about your if, if it's when you're talking about engagement you're talking about people interacting on social media and so don't forget to do something that is going to prompt that as well um i know we always say and end with a call to action or whatever whatever but do get get your audience interacting you know you've got to do something to make them want to do that so um yeah just do something that they're not expecting from your industry is always a good place to start that's a great Nigel might have some more yeah. ideas. Well, I was just going to build on that because it, for me, this is all around positioning. And even the fact that you're suggesting as a credit management um, debt chasing company, you're going to do video will differentiate you from other people that aren't doing that. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the obvious thing might be to go and make it a bit more engaging and entertaining and funny. But I think the fact that not many people are doing them at all will differentiate you enough for people to get engaged. And I think what you don't want to do is approach it i would say from a brand point of view as a scary thing but you as the professional as a kind of go-to person that can support and help people through this because you're a nice lovely person is probably the way to do it rather than saying are you scared of debt i'll help because that's that will put people off and we talk a lot certainly in charities things about not uh, you know it kind of you've got to get people to look at you rather than turn away from you and when you're talking about a subject that is tricky for people, you've got to do that in all the compassion way, as well as be engaging, but you'll, you'll make a difference by just doing video. That's number one. I'm say thank you very much to both of you for taking all of those questions today. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left now. So I just really want to say a very big thank you to you both as our guest speakers today to talk about branding and video creation. And it's been, incredibly insightful and I've definitely learned a lot and I, I know and I'm sure our delegates today have learned a lot too. So thank you very much um, for to Pin Creative and to Visible Impact. I'm going to ask you one quick question, both of you. Nigel, what's your call to action today for our delegates? Well, I would say that, you know, the number one thing to think about is learn from the competition this whole thing about position just like a bit saying knowing what competition are doing is going to really help you to align or differentiate yourself and it's the number one thing that i don't actually hear people talking about a lot they talk a lot about oh, know your audience know your offer understand your competition i think that will really help people to be different or aligned because you can have a benefit from aligning with someone that's doing something successfully and amy in 10 seconds call to action from you I mean, know what's coming. Just press record. I would say create create a 30 second video every day for a week, even if you don't post them on social media, even if you just show them to your mum, your dog, your cat and get used to the idea of pressing record. Excellent. Thank you to you both. Thank you to our audience today. If you've enjoyed today's webinar, please head over to our FSB Trust Pilot page and leave us a review. Thank you very much for joining us.